Good morning. Welcome to the returning post-COVID-19 Employer's Guide on Workplace Safety and Health. I am your host, Gloria McMullen of Encompass Michigan. To minimize background noise, please mute your audio. Phones may be muted by pressing star six. I ask that you please enter your name and organization in the chat function to serve as a virtual roll call. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have questions, please wait until the end of the presentation. At that time, you may submit your questions through the chat function or by pressing star six to unmute your phone and to then speak. The recording of this webinar will be available on the Encompass Michigan website by the end of the week. Our presenter today is Deborah Zill. Deborah is a senior occupational safety consultant who joined the consultation, education, and training division of Myosha in 2006. Before that, she had over a decade of safety and health experience in private industry. Deb currently provides consultation and training services for Midwest Michigan. Deb, welcome, and thank you for presenting this webinar for Encompass Michigan members today. I now present to you Deb Zill. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can bear with me. This is one of my first virtual training sessions that I get to give and hopefully everything will go along smoothly. Um, in fact, Gloria, right now it looks like I'm having a difficult time moving screens. There we go. Um, so today we are gonna talk about our plans for returning to work uh, post COVID-19. And I'm not sure if we're gonna get post COVID-19 for a while, but we're gonna have to figure out how to go back to work with COVID-19. So that's where we're at uh, for my OSHA as far as helping employers uh, decipher where or how is the best moves uh, going forward and to keep your employees safe. Our objectives today are gonna to be looking at the COVID-19 overview, what is it? Um, we're gonna look at some rules, emergency rules for COVID-19, hazard assessments to do in your own house, exposure control, Workplace procedures, including applicable MyOSHA rules that include personal protective equipment, sanitation, and general duty obligations. We're going to talk about disinfecting methods, and we're going to look at what to do if your employees do have symptoms. We're going to talk about providing employee training. We're going to look briefly at what that means for temporary workforce concerns, and I will give you a list of resources as well. So just an overview, I think we've all been watching the news quite a bit, but we'll, we're just kind of recap what we have for um, coronavirus. Coronavirus is actually a family of viruses that causes people to become ill, but coronaviruses usually circulate amongst animals, including camels, cattle, cats. I think you've seen in the news, the uh, tigers at the zoos being affected. One of the, um, the one that we're dealing with right now is the seventh known human coronavirus. Uh, also known as COVID-19. It is thought to have jumped species from an animal uh, and began infecting humans last fall. Um, the coronavirus has uh, other outbreaks that we've heard of in our history, our recent history, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, otherwise known as SARS, and we also had the Middle East respiratory syndrome known as MERS, both in my lifetime at least. But we have not as humans, uh, seen a, a virus this widespread or impactful since the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic flu. So a little bit of overview of the signs and symptoms of uh, COVID-19. They can go from almost non-existent, mild to severe respiratory illness. They can cause uh, severe pneumonia-like illnesses. Typical symptoms in people who are going to be symptomatic are going to have a fever of greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. They'll have a dry cough, a shortness of breath, and many have been known to um, say that they have a, a loss of taste or smell. Now the fun thing with the coronavirus, this one, COVID-19, is that you have that two to 14 day window before um, you may show symptoms. So you may be symptomatic enough to pass it on uh, for an extended period of time, which means that it 
passes easier uh, than the regular flu or things along those lines. Bear with me, it seems like I have a pause as I'm trying to switch screens. Here we go. Um, so how is it spread? The primary way that COVID-19 is spread is from contact to contact, person to person, through respiratory droplets, um, usually with people who are symptomatic uh, within six feet of each other. It can also be uh, spread through contamination on surfaces where you touch a surface that has been contaminated with the respiratory droplets, and then you touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. And this is where the CDC is recommending the cloth coverings for all noses and mouths to try to limit the exposure, both from the person who may be exposed and to kind of put that barrier between you and your hands, because we do touch our face hundreds of times in a five minute period. And it's surprising how often we actually touch our faces. So it is a limiter of that contact. So let's talk about some of the applicable rules and regulations uh, that we currently have in place. If we're looking at MIOSHA standards, uh, several of the ones that you see in the right-hand box, we have some emergency rules for COVID-19. What we mean by that is um, we are looking at the CDC guidelines and we do have the option of putting the general duty clause in place if, um, employers are purely negligent in trying to protect their employees. Um, and this will come into play when we're talking about personal protective equipment, hazard communication, respiratory protection, record keeping, and sanitation. The ones that I see being the biggest um, issues are going to fall into PPE, hazard communication, and record keeping um, because of the confusing elements of those standards and making sure that the employers understand their responsibilities. You should remember that MIOSHA can use the general duty clause when we do not have a specific rule in place, um, but we do have to be able to show um, that the employer was uh, egregious in, in their lack of attempt to protect their employees. We do have an in, uh, enforcement uh, interim plan. A lot of the uh, activity, we have seen a five time increase in complaints in the last month and a half. Uh, similar to unemployment claims, the amount of claims uh, or complaints coming in from employees has been um, enormous in comparison to what it was. In fact, they've taken a lot of uh, staff from our consultation side and push them over to our enforcement side to help out with those complaints. There is an interim enforcement um, plan that is available on that link. So you should be able to have um, the ability to see where that link goes and see how the enforcement officers are currently handling MIOSHA complaints. So for hazard assessments. We're following the MIOSHA, um, oop, Gloria, do you have control? Okay, for hazard assessments, uh, exposure and risk, we are following the CDC, if we could go back one. Thank you. Um, if, if we're looking at the hazard assessments, exposure risk, we are following the CDC guidelines for the very high, high, medium, and lower risk. When we're looking at those very high and high, those are the people that are knowingly coming to, into contact with people who have COVID-19. That's your very high people. They're gonna be healthcare, laboratory workers, and morgue employees. High risk is where we have suspected or um, potential exposure. The suspected exposure is gonna have uh, the people in categories such as healthcare delivery, support staff, medical uh, transport workers. In those two categories, you're going to see a much higher uh, level of protections going forward. In the medium risk, and I think this is where a majority of you are going to fall, between medium and low. In the medium risk, we're saying that this is where we're going to have frequent contact with people, just with 
people who may be infected uh, within that six foot distance. So this is gonna include people in the general public, maybe in schools, high population density work environments where we can't maintain necessarily that six foot uh, distancing. Low risk is gonna be people who can work from home, work in offices, limit contact uh, into their areas. They're gonna have minimal or no coworker or public contact. So when we're looking at the risk exposures, the next thing that we're going to look at is how are we going to protect our employees based on their risk? So where, how, and what are the uh, exposures that they're gonna be um, having in, in contact? So we have, are they going to be in contact with the general public? Are they gonna be in contact with your customers or visitors or coworkers? This is something that you are going to have to do an individualized assessment for your employees. And then based on what, how, and where their exposure is going to be, now how are we gonna mitigate that exposure? Is there anything that we can do in our environment, in our work environment, where we're gonna have the ability to um, increase the social distancing? For example, are we gonna stagger work shifts? Can we get people so that they are not all coming in at the same time using the same doors? Can we stagger our lunch breaks um, or our, our lunch breaks, the times that we are working? Can we downsize the operations and limit exposure that way? How many people can we get to telework or work from home? Again, limiting our exposure. And then if we do have critical tasks that need to be performed, but we can let other ones go, can we cross train several people to do those critical tasks again to limit the workforce that is coming in? We'd like you to assess the job tasks with shared equipment and workstations. Now this is key, especially for people who are working with the public, working on cash registers, um, touching the same equipment all day long, and based on those equipment sharing operations and workstations, looking at how you're going to use basic infection prevention. The key thing that we are pushing, just like the CDC, is access to hand washing facilities. Hand washing facilities, as far as your soaps, do not need to be antibacterial. Soap, regular soap will work just as well as lifting off the virus and washing it down the drains if you follow the uh, minimum of 20 second hand washing requirements. Lacking hand washing facilities, hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol is the next protection. It will um, help kill off that virus, but it doesn't wash it away necessarily. So we are looking at that as far as basic personal uh, control. And then for those multi uh, workstation areas or those multi shared uh, pieces of equipment, cleaning and disinfecting procedures need to be in place. And that's gonna be a huge part of getting our workforce back into play. So let's talk about that exposure control, that uh, cleaning and disinfecting. Whenever you can remove, remove the human from the element, try to do that. And here's what I'm saying. There's a hierarchy of controls when we look at any health hazard. So can you eliminate the possibility of uh, someone coming into, into contact with that hazard, this hazard being um, COVID-19? Where you can eliminate, eliminate. Where you can substitute or replace people, person, or things, try to substitute. And then we get into engineering controls. Now, the engineering controls that they have listed here are typically going to be used in your high or very high risk areas, where we're looking at high efficiency air filters, increased ventilation rates, physical barriers like plastic sheeting, sneeze guards, plexiglass, things along those lines. Um, we can use those at those medium and lows, those plastic barriers. You're just gonna see more and more of those showing up in uh, grocery stores. Uh, gas stations, things along those lines, and where possible installing drive-through windows for your pharmacies um, and your food delivery systems. If you cannot engineer out contact or control the, um, the filters or the ventilation in your facility to that level, 
Then we move into administrative controls. So look at the engineering first and then move into administrative controls. And we kind of touched on that a couple slides ago. Offer pickup options for customers to minimize contact between employees, clients, and customers wherever possible. Again, getting that social distancing in place. Establish self-assessment for employees prior to entering the workplace. And what we mean by that is establish a training where people are basically asked to take their temperature and and do a self-check before they come into work and if they suspect that they are symptomatic to not come into work so that's a self-assessment that maybe you want to put in place for your employees implement telework uh, from home whenever possible or feasible use alternate or staggering work shifts to reduce the number of employees in the facility at the time Train on good hand washing and respiratory uh, hygiene and post signs to encourage behavior. So we need reminders. This is a whole new way of thinking for every one of us. We have not been uh, necessarily brought up in the medical field where we're used to wearing masks on a regular basis. So we need reminders. For personal protective equipment, obviously the higher the risk, category, the higher the personal protective equipment that you're going to have in place. So if you look over to the right of this slide, uh, we have the gloves, the goggles, maybe the, the lab coat and things along those lines. I'm typically going to see that in a medical type environment, uh, but not to say that I'm not going to see gloves and face cloth coverings in medium and low risk exposure areas. Where we see the low, low risk, you might not need any personal protective equipment, uh, but we do recommend, like the CDC, that everyone do wear a face covering while in public to protect your neighbors as well as yourself. Okay, so I have been getting nonstop questions about cloth face covering, surgical face masks, or filtering face masks as respirators. So what they're asking for the general public and maybe your medium and low risk workers is that they use the cloth or paper face masks, even up to a surgical face mask. Again, this is not considered to be a respirator. If you look at the left-hand box, the cloth or the surgical masks are not respirators. We start falling into a respirator uh, respirator category when we hit those N95 or P95 masks where we're um, uh, requiring more requirements for you to have a respiratory program in place. Uh, I found, we found a, a very nice table uh, put out by the Maryland Department of Labor which breaks down in table format an employer's guide for voluntary versus required respirator use. Now Again, cloth and paper masks or surgical masks are not respirators. N95s or um, half face masks or full face mask or pappers, that's when we start getting into a full respirator program. And when you get into that N95, we have to start asking and up, we have to start asking um, what do we need to do to be compliant with my OSHA requirements? Because even if they bring them from home, but they're using them within your facility, it does kick the standard into gear. And here's what I mean by that. If we see N95s uh, that are being used by your employees, if you provided it or if they brought it from home, they're still using it in the work environment. So there are some requirements on the employer to make sure that we do not have additional hazards being uh, introduced to the employees. So if you have a required use uh, N95, then you have to do fit testing. You have to do a medical evaluation, which is basically a questionnaire that you send off to your occupational doctor. You have to limit facial hair. It has to be eliminated in order to get a good seal. You have to have your employees sign an Appendix D that is associated with Part 451 as far as our respirator standard. You have to give them training on what that mask can and cannot do, when to get rid of it, how to sanitize it and maintain and store it uh, as well. 
If it's voluntary use, you'll see that there's lots of no's in that category. There's not fit testing requirements. There's not medical evaluation requirements. There is not facial hair prohibitations, but they do have to sign the Appendix D and they do have to be trained on how to clean, store, and maintain that respirator so that it does not introduce any new hazards to them. I'm sure I'm gonna have questions on those later. This is a very key slide, it's very helpful. I encourage you to come back to it. So establishing workplace procedures. So we briefly touched on this before, in fact, it's a duplicate of the slide. If you are bringing people back to work, we want you to be aware that there are some requirements for those N95s, for gloves that you might require, if you're gonna require goggles, you do need to do a hazard assessment under part 33, which is our personal protective equipment standard. Just write down what you, the employer, are going to require and why. Um, for hazard communication, this is going to be a, a bigger issue because we are looking at those cleaning and sanitation methods where we are going to potentially have chemicals that don't mix together very well. So we need to give extra training, like don't mix your bleach and ammonia. This is the hazard that's going to happen. Whatever cleaning solutions you're going to use, you're going to have to assure that your employees have been trained on what uh, the hazards of that chemical are, how to protect themselves, and what to look for for signs and symptoms um, as far as overexposure or cross exposures uh, between chemicals. Respiratory protection, if you are going to require N95 masks or half face masks in your environment, you have to comply with all of the requirements in the respiratory protection standard. If your employees are bringing respirators from home, you still need to assure that you have um, the parts required for the Appendix D sign off and the training for storage taken care of. I would encourage you to write a policy that assures that if your people are bringing in voluntary use on their own respirators, those N95s and up, that they know that they have to tell the office, they have to get some extra training, and they have to sign off that the employer does not require them under the Appendix D. Record keeping. For record keeping, um, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more as well, but um, keep in mind the high and very high risk um, employees are more than likely going to have known cases of coming in contact with COVID-19 and it will be recordable if it fits all of the recording criteria. And I'll expand on that a little bit later. When we're talking about the medium and low risk recording criteria, it gets a little more difficult to say that they have known contact. And what I mean by that is we've all heard about the pork processing plants in, in South Dakota. We can see a direct relationship. There is, um, an obvious case that they are getting COVID-19 from their work environment because of the amount of cases that are coming out of the plant. Um, without that start, if you have employees that are exposed to the general public, but it's not going, um, you don't have several known cases coming from your employees, it probably is not going to be a recordable case. And again, I'm gonna expand on that in a little bit. We also have sanitation uh, requirements under 474, making sure that we are not knowingly exposing our employees to known hazards. And then general duty, as I mentioned earlier, if the employer is just egregious and does basically nothing to protect their employees, um, we have four legs that we need to stand on in order to file a general duty um, citation. If all four legs are met, we do have that possibility to provide a citation without a rule that is listed under PPE, hazard communication, respiratory protection, or sanitation. So the CDC does have lots of resources that I strongly encourage you to um, check out. Uh, preparing your small business and your employers for uh, COVID-19. 
and cleaning and disinfecting your um, facilities. They also have many uh, posters that you can access. And I apologize for my puppy who's 10 months old locked in my bedroom making lots of noise in the background. Hopefully that's not too distracting. We have uh, Reopening America. I think we've seen that. There is a scan for more information that you can scan off of this PowerPoint. We also have a link to a list of EPA disinfectants and, for the coronavirus. It lists all of the EPA disinfectants that will be effective for the coronavirus. If you're having a hard time finding bleach solution, for example, then you can go to uh, the EPA list and find that. For workplace procedures, some key elements to keep in mind and things that I would encourage you to write down is to have a uh, development of the infectious disease preparedness response plan. If you have not already done so, we are now living with needing to have a written document in our workplaces that prepares us for a pandemic. Um, so we're, we're looking for that development of an exposure control plan, uh, identifying workplace COVID-19 coordinator. So who's going to be your point person in-house to help you through that process. Uh, examine and update your policies for telework, for leave of your employees, for employee compensation. Um, a lot of people are coming to work sick because they don't feel that they could possibly uh, not show up to work and still be able to support their families. So if you feel that that is something that you need to address, I would address it in your procedures. Identify essential employees for business functions, what absolutely must go on. Establish a chain of communication. Um, and I'm gonna use uh, the South Dakota plant again. Um, where you can uh, have people who are going to address your employees, address the media, um, et cetera, making sure that uh, they have uh, speaking points as well as being able to um, have a list of known government officials that need to be contacted uh, would be good. So train your employees on the new procedures and the policies. Now that may also include the self-testing before you come to work. Some employers are taking temperatures before they're allowing people to punch in. Um, how you're going to establish that training program is up to you at this point, but there should be some kind of a, a checkpoint in that process. So facility preparedness, uh, HVAC functions. If your facility has been 100% shut down and you're gonna come back and kick on the HVAC, uh, make sure that you run it for 48 hours or so before you introduce employees again, because uh, Legionnaires is also a, a, a respiratory um, bacteria that presents like pneumonia in people who are exposed to it. And it usually comes off of your HVAC symptom or systems when they have been sitting for a while and they've, they've developed this bacteria and then you kick them on and it gets pushed through your entire facility and people become exposed. Because it is respiratory in nature, um, it could very easily be confused if people do have symptoms with COVID-19. It could be in your HVAC, it could be in your uh, cooling towers, uh, emergency, as far as your, um, emergency exit areas, making sure that they are kept clear, make sure your general housekeeping uh, is good. And then we've talked before about the cleaning and disinfecting of your frequently used surfaces, such as door handles, countertops, handrails, workstations, et cetera. Where you have lots of contact, make sure you have a plan for cleaning and disinfecting. So we also have a, a link here to the uh, a guidance for the facility managers for HVAC and cooling towers that will help you uh, assure that you are reducing your risk of Legionnaires um, for building closures, et cetera.
We would like to see going forward, every employer have a plan in place for self-screening of employers prior to work. We would like to also see in that plan uh, some training or the required employees to report those symptoms and to self-isolate where possible. We would like you to have a uh, process for your employees to notify their supervisors and to stay at home. Don't allow your employees to, don't allow your employees to return to work until their home isolation criteria is met. And I'm going to talk about that just briefly here in a couple of minutes. And then inform other employees of uh, possible workplace exposures. So keeping confidentiality as far as who it is, but letting them know, yes, we have a known case uh, in our facility. That alone will uptick your amount of uh, cleaning and disinfecting. Encourage your sick employees to stay home. Update your sick leave policies and public health guidances. Train your employees on those policies that you're putting into place and your sick leave uh, procedures. Where, wherever possible, keep your social distancing a minimum of six feet and provide uh, lines of demarcation. So where possible, I think you've seen it in stores lately, they put putting little X's on the floor uh, indicating where people should stand to keep that social distance uh, away from the next person. Where possible, install physical barriers between customers and employees. So for cleaning procedures, the employer should routinely clean and disinfect all areas such as offices, bathrooms, common areas, and shared electronic equipment. Where you have uh, people using the same credit card machine, are you going to wipe it down every customer or every third customer have a, a procedure in place. If a sick employee is suspected or confirmed to have COVID-19, perform enhanced cleaning and disinfection of all frequently touched surfaces in the workplace. Follow the manufacturer's instructions for all cleaning and disinfecting um, products. Here's what, I'm, here's what that means. Bleach, um, we use it every single day. But bleach should be used, if it's being used on a regular basis, you should probably have gloves on because there are some hazards associated with that. If there's a potential of splashback, even at a 10 to 1 um, uh, dilution, there might be a need to require some kind of a safety glass. So look at your SDSs for your chemicals that you're going to be using and follow the manufacturer's recommendations for PPE, for concentration, and for the application method um, and contact time to make it effective. Evaluate your procedures to ensure that no hazards are created, uh, such as dermatitis, which is quite common uh, for using uh, disinfectants. So um, some people are more sensitive than others. Make sure they know what the potential hazard is after use or before use. So cleaning. Cleaning refers to the removal of germs, dirt, or impurities. It does not kill germs, but it does remove them. Soap and water are very effective. Again, it does not have to be antibacterial uh, soap. It can be any soap. Soap in and of itself has the ability to lift off uh, those, those germs, that dirt, and, and wash it down the drain if it's done correctly. Disinfecting refers to the use of chemicals uh, to kill germs on surfaces. This process does not necessarily clean dirty surfaces or remove germs, but it kills germs on the surfaces after it's been cleaned. Some of those common disinfectants are bleach solutions. So one third cup bleach per gallon of water or four teaspoons of bleach per quart. So that is effective to kill off germs. 70% alcohol solutions may also be used, such as wipes or liquids on hard surfaces. Not on your skin, 60% or more is effective on your skin, 70% or more uh, is effective on hard surfaces. And common products uh, that you can use, this is not an all-inclusive list and they are not to be used together, but some of the things that you can use are uh, Windex disinfectant cleaner, Comet disinfectant bathroom cleaner, Scrubbing bubbles, restroom cleaner uh, type two will work, 
and Lysol bathroom cleaner. Again, go back to that uh, list that we had earlier from the CDC. There is an all-inclusive list, close to 200 different chemicals that you can use. These are just some of the common ones that we see every day on the shelf. For employer reporting procedures, uh, again, we're going back to your written procedure. Make sure you have a list of who is, what, what needs to be done for reporting. Require your employers, employees to report that they are sick or experiencing symptoms of COVID-19, and then contact your local state health department immediately when a worker may have COVID-19, especially if you have to work in tight quarters or you have a high or very high risk category. Recording your COVID-19 illnesses on the MyOSHA log. Um, my understanding is a lot of you are, are temporary staffing agencies. So this is going to eventually be played out and I'll talk about it a little bit more, but healthcare industries, emergency response organizations, and correctional institutions must continue to determine work-relatedness based on standard, which means if they know they have cases in those industries, not only do they have to have a COVID-19 diagnosis, but they have to meet the other legs to meet recordability, which means that they have to prove that it was um, work related. They have to be able to say that it required above and beyond first aid. It required some kind of medical treatment. So not your over-the-counter Tylenol or ibuprofen or over-the-counter flu remedies. They had to have a prescription or above. Um, so that leg needs to be met as well. Other employers are to make uh, work-related determinations based on reasonability, uh, reasonably available objective evidence. Again, I'm going to go back to the South Dakota, South Dakota pork plant where they had over 700 employees diagnosed with COVID-19. That is obviously reasonably available objective evidence saying that it is work-related. Federal OSHA also has an enforcement memo re for about recording COVID-19 cases, and we've provided a link here. So procedures uh, for your sick employees, make sure you train them on procedures. And here, here's what we're recommending. For returning to work after COVID-19, for non-healthcare settings, the employees should be free of symptoms and fever for at least three days without taking medications to reduce that fever. And they have an improvement in their respiratory sy symptoms, which means that they're not gonna come back to work coughing on everyone or have a shortness of breath issue. And at least seven days has passed since symptoms first appeared. That is the guidelines being set out by the CDC. These are the guidelines that we are recommending. We are not enforcing. These are the guidelines that we are recommending at this time. So for employee training, cannot push enough the hygiene etiquette in washing your hands. Hand washing with soap and water is very effective. Wash your hands for a minimum of 20 seconds. Scrub all surfaces of your hands, the fingers, the back of your hands, your fingernails, et cetera. If soap and water is not available, use hand sanitizer. The hand sanitizer should list that it has greater, um, at least 60% alcohol. Training your employees on how to uh, correctly cough or sneeze. So covering their mouth and nose with a tissue. If you don't have a tissue, use your upper sleeve, not your hands because your hands touch all those hard surfaces. And remember to wash your hands afterwards. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth uh, with unwashed hands. So wherever possible, um, having close proximity to hand washing facilities or to your hand sanitizer is going to be key to preventing spread. No, there is not a requirement requirement to uh, wash your hands after so many times of using the hand sanitizer, but the hand washing is actually more effective uh, than, than using the hand sanitizer. Uh, I mentioned before that the CDC has great posters that you can, that 
will help you uh, remind your employees of what to do and what not to do. I encourage you to check out the links there for their posters uh, and uh, put them around your facility. Employee training, make sure you're training uh, your employees on the new policies that you're probably going to be putting into place because of the pandemic. So if you are putting policies in place that include self-screening procedures, telework duties, employee sick policies, leave policies, if these change because of this pandemic, make sure training is robust enough to assure that you do not have sick people coming to work or that they're coming to work because they're worried uh, about um, other things uh, that affect their, their pocketbook or their families. New controls. So we in the past, we have not seen a lot of barriers at cash registers, but I'm starting to see them more and more. Um, where possible, if you can get rid of um, the possibility of people doing face-to-face uh, -face contact and put drive-throughs in place, uh, make sure that you use what is available when available. For the cleaning of the workspace, uh, have procedures in place. How often are you going to clean? What are those shared surfaces? How often should those shared surfaces be cleaned? Making sure that you have enough stock and PPE um, to uh, assure employee safety. Make sure if you are requiring additional cleaning and you are bringing in new chemicals that the training of the new disinfectants is robust enough to assure that they are protecting themselves from that one chemical, but also that they do not mix cleaning chemicals. So it's good to do a chemical inventory of your facility and make sure that you do not have uh, cleaning materials that are going to react badly uh, with each other. And again, I'm gonna go back to the most common one that we see is the bleach and ammonia mixtures. Where possible, uh, using changes in shift schedule, um, lunch schedules, break schedules, et cetera, having staggered times to come in, if that's a possibility, again, reducing the amount of people being exposed to those hard surfaces. And then and training on why you're doing it in the first place. So because my understanding is that you are, um, this group particularly has uh, joint employment structures. And, and what I mean by that is you have a host employer and a staffing agency, and you are both responsible for the safety of the temporary worker. And it's sometimes hard to figure out who has what responsibilities. It is a shared responsibility over that employer. So um, that temporary worker must be protected and how you write your contracts is going to be key. I'm going to get into that a little bit more and give you a couple of examples. So in a temporary staffing agency, it is not uncommon for a temporary staffing agency to give somewhat generic training. What does it mean to, for example, um, what do I do in case of a fire? Who do I contact? How do I start up a, a system? in a generic way. This is, this is you sending somebody out to a host facility. The host facility then has responsibilities to assure that that employee knows the specific routes to get out of um, that area, uh, that they know how to contact local emergency. What's the number? Do I have to dial nine, then 911? Do I have to just dial 911? Uh, what information should I be giving? What's the address of my location, et cetera? If I have employees who are authorized and should be authorized to start up alarms, where do they start up those alarms? Is it via the phone? Is it on a, a pull cord somewhere? The host employer has the responsibilities to provide that training. When we're talking about record keeping, the staffing agency may provide procedures for obtaining treatment for on-the-job injuries, like who do they contact at the staffing agency, but again, the host employer actually has more responsibility um, for assuring that there is a supervisor to contact. <laughs> and I apologize for the technical dog again. Um, so the host employer has the ability to um, take on the recordability of that employee's injury if they are injured in the host employer's facility. Recordability goes back to the host employer, not the temporary staffing agency. 
So although this temporary staffing agency has responsibility to provide medical treatment, tell them where to go and give them paperwork to fill out, the 300 log responsibility goes to the host employer or to the employer that is providing the day-to-day -day supervision of that employee. And I'm sure we're gonna have a few questions on that um, as we go through. So with or without a pandemic, there are responsibilities from both the temporary staffing agency and the host employer. And we encourage you to conduct a safety and health training for all new project orientation um, processes between a temporary staffing agency and a new host. Develop an injury and illness tracking system so you know who is being hurt and where. Implement an injury and illness prevention program. Work with your host employers to figure out what their hazards are and how to prevent injuries and illnesses of your temporary staff. Conduct incident and injury illness uh, investigations together where necessary and to maintain contact with your workers. Um, once they are, are leave your facility, if it is a long or a short term job, making sure that you have a way of maintaining contact with those workers so that you can address their concerns as soon as possible. Both the temporary um, staffing agency and the host employer have to agree that every worker has the right to a safe and healthy work environment. The staffing agency and the host employer are joint employers of that temporary worker and therefore both have responsibility for providing and maintaining a safe work environment for those workers. They have to work together and MyOSHA will cite um, both employers depending on uh, the severity of exposure to any injury or hazard, um, hazard that resulted in injury or illness. So that's something that you should be working out uh, via contract as well as contact with your uh, host employers. I'm gonna skip over that one because this is the resource page with all of the links on it uh, for the MyOSHA enforcement guidance, uh, where our enforcement people are and how they are enforcing COVID-19 uh, complaints. We have more general information about the coronavirus and frequently asked questions uh, linked there. We have an OSHA uh, COVID-19 information page link, publications from federal OSHA as well as the CDC. And uh, earlier when we were talking about the respirators and face covering fact sheets, there's also a link there for that. And that is the presentation, the PowerPoint uh, presentation. So I am going to pass it back to Gloria, who can tell me if you want to field questions that came in through chat or if we're just going to allow people to ask questions at this time. Thank you, Deb. We do have a couple of questions and I'm going to start with the first question. If clients are unable to proceed, I'm sorry, if clients are unable to social distance, um, or wear face mask, what do we do? Under what circumstances, I guess I'm, I'm a little confused, um, would they not be able to wear a face mask? Or a, and again, um, a face covering, a cloth covering, yeah. not necessarily an N95. There could be a medical condition. Okay, so medical conditions, um, again, if they have a medical condition like a, a COPD, um, an emphysema, an asthma that would be triggered by a cloth face covering. Uh, that's understandable as the employer. Uh, you're going to train on if you have those conditions, make sure that you let the employer know. And whenever possible, those people who do not have medical conditions should be wearing a cloth face covering under CDC recommendations. Next question, is there a requirement to wash hands after so many uses of hand sanitizer? No, there's not. Who enforces OSHA standards? Um, okay, so back in the 70s, I'll give you a little history lesson. Here's what happened. In 1970, my, uh, federal OSHA uh, came into existence and at that time they asked the states if they wanted to fall under the federal OSHA standards or if they wanted to create their own. In order to have a state-run program you had to have 
uh, either adopted the federal program or had a more strict rule. And in the 70s, uh, because Michigan was such a huge manufacturer, we came up with our own state program and we had a lot of those rules already in place under the Department of Labor. Federal OSHA has no jurisdiction in Michigan um, unless they are uh, on an open seafaring waterway, unless they are going underground in a mine, um, or if they're at a federal facility such as a post office or a prison. Otherwise, Michigan OSHA has full jurisdiction, and we have an enforcement staff of my OSHA enforcement officers uh, that come out of Lansing and cover the entire state. If we have to reset workstations and common areas to ensure social distancing, but some employees refuse to do so, is it required by my OSHA or OSHA that we discipline them in order to avoid an OSHA finding? My OSHA is never going to um, cite an individual. Uh, we are going to look at that potentially as a case, it, it, case by case. Um, if we walk into your facility and we see everyone standing on top of each other, um, then we're going to say that the employer did not do their due diligence to assure that the training and the recommendations for their safety are being held up by the employer. Um, if it's one or two people who are just continually encroaching onto other people's uh, space, you might have the argument of saying that this is an individual uh, situation and you would easily be able to avoid a citation. It's gonna come down to what do we see when we walk into your environment? If we see no training, uh, we see no social distancing whatsoever, no attempt at social distancing, no markings on uh, uh, your cafeteria tables, no markings on the floor, things along those lines that help them identify those areas, then there's a potential that we could go under general duty. Okay. Can employers deny the use of N95 masks at their facilities, even if voluntarily used? Yes, as the employer, you can do that. Um, but if people do bring them in from home and it's voluntary use, uh, I would encourage you to just uh, go through with the sign off of the Appendix D and train them that it's only effective um, for so many uses without disinfecting or, or replacement. Um, there's really not a lot of requirements uh, for the N95 uh, voluntary use. So you could limit it, but I'm not sure if it's, um, it, it's such a huge task that it wouldn't be manageable. If working with children, should the children be wearing the face mask too? Face, again, the face masks are meant for somebody who might be carrying the virus that if they happen to um, cough, sneeze, spread those uh, droplets uh, onto a hard surface, it's for the other people that you're protecting. Should, you be, um, should children have cloth coverings? It's recommended for everyone who can. Now, are kids going to have a hard time keeping it on? Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, we're, we're, you know, it, where you can, yes, and where you can't control it, we understand that children are children. It's, it's an education that we're going to have to build on. My OSHA has no control over children. I'm struggling finding cleaning supplies like sanitizer, medical grade cleaning spray wipes. Is it fair to say I can't open until I secure these items? or are there any leads on where to find these for a medical office? I would encourage you to look at that all-inclusive uh, NIOSH list um, because like I said, there are almost 200 individual chemicals that you could order uh, either through, it, maybe it's difficult to find um, at Myers or at uh, Menards or Lowe's or things along those lines, but all of your suppliers, your industrial suppliers, um, uh, McCormick, there's some that you'll probably be able to find straight from the manufacturer. I'd look at that list carefully and see if you can get a hold of the manufacturer for purchase. I wouldn't say that, um, I, I would say that that list is all inclusive for what we know will uh, disinfect and kill the coronavirus. And don't forget bleach is very effective. If a job task requires that someone is less than six feet from another, 
taking forehead temperatures, are we required to issue N95 mask? You are not required to issue an N95 mask unless your employees fall into that high or very high risk category. Um, that's where we've determined that their level of risk would require an N95 mask. If you're at that medium or low, that is employer to employer determination uh, on if they are going to require it or not. Did I answer the question? If the person is taking um, another employee's temperature? It's a, it's a good idea, but again, cloth coverings is that barrier between you and somebody who might be sick. I would not require an N95. We transport our workers to work. What kind of measures should we take as things like social distancing are hard to adhere to in vehicles? Yes, it is. Um, and again, uh, because of your risk assessment, you're going to look at your potential. So you're going to train your employees to help themselves as far as self-identification. Uh, we are going to start opening up the public again. So we need to take extra precautions with assuring that we train them on um, personal hygiene. Um, making sure that they are hand washing and sanitizing whenever possible, that the vehicles that you're using are also being um, disinfected uh, after uses. And um, every, every company is going to handle this differently, but that's definitely a situation where you have that shared equipment that you're going to up your disinfecting policies to assure that you are eliminating those germs as quickly and effectively as possible. How does social distancing work with skill building or training programs where consumers come into our buildings for programming? Again, wherever you can limit the amount of people coming in so that you can disinfect in between. Um, wherever you can distance, keeping that distance in mind. I'm, I'm not saying you can do that in every situation. But wherever you can, you try to get the six foot distancing in between you and the next person. Are there any suggested vehicle transportation regulations? Not at this time. Do you have thoughts on how speech therapists should proceed with respect to face coverings? <laughs> uh, whenever possible, try to do virtual um, uh, speech therapy. My sister is actually a speech therapist uh, down in Louisville for their school system. Whenever possible, if you can do it virtually instead of in person, uh, try to do it that way. Um, as far as uh, the six foot distancing, if you can get the six foot distancing and then uh, you, knowing that you're going to have not have your face covering on at that time, you're going to up your disinfectant plan. If we don't require an N95 mask to take people's forehead temperature, but the employee feels more comfortable doing it with an N95 and we give it to them on a voluntary basis, then do we need to do all the training? You still need to um, have them sign the Appendix D and the training that is on the Appendix D, which basically says as an employer, we are not requiring it. This is why we're not requiring it. You are doing this off of a voluntary basis. Um, here are the limitations of the piece of equipment that you are voluntarily using. They're going to sign off on that and then also assuring that they understand the limitations of that N95. Um, how long it's good for, uh, how many uses it's good for, how they're going to potentially uh, take care of and maintain that N95. And when staff work at family homes with consumers, are there recommendations for cleaning protocols? Um, when you're working in, in patients' homes, you're going to look more at your personal protective equipment. If you're cleaning your homes, uh, I would be looking for the disinfectants that we know are being effective. But PPE is going to be your biggest um, concern as far as you might want to up into safety glasses to limit the amount of times that you inadvertently touch your face, uh, making sure that you have your cloth uh, covering over your nose and your mouth 
gloves are going to be a good idea, but gloves are not your save all either. In fact, soap is still the number one recommended way to, to prevent germs from spreading into your eyes, nose, or mouth. Do we have any other questions out there? All right. Well, as a reminder, this recording will be available by the end of the week on the Encompass Michigan website. If you have any questions after this webinar has concluded, please don't hesitate to email me and I'll get an answer to you. Thank you again, Deb, for the presentation and thank you to all of you for participating today. You guys stay safe. Thank you.